And of course, the biggest question of all is why is autism on the rise? The latest CDC statistics from the United States indicate that one in 88 children will eventually receive an ASD diagnosis. By all indications, the statistics are very similar in Canada. As discussed in this article in Nature in 2011, entitled The Prevalence Puzzle, Autism Counts, the left graph documents the increase in the number of diagnoses between 1975 and 2009. The right pie graph provides possible explanations which include the following. First, spatial clustering, which may account for up to 4% of the increase. In this group, it is surmised that there could be an environmental agent affecting populations, or perhaps for one reason or another, a neighborhood of families could become so sophisticated on the topic of autism that a cluster of informed parents and specialists builds up diagnosing and treating more children. A second reason, which may account for up to 10% of the increase, may be explained by a social change with biological implications. For example, people now tend to have children older in life because of education and um, uh, um, the social structure set up by a knowledge-based uh, society. And there's data emerging from both population and genetic studies that indicate children born to parents older than 35 have a higher risk of being diagnosed with autism. Third, 15% of the observed increase may be accounted for by growing awareness about autism. Simply put, more parents and pediatricians know about it, so it is diagnosed more often. Fourth, perhaps another 25% of the rise in autism may be attributed to the so-called diagnostic accretion. That is, children who would have been diagnosed with what we used to call mental retardation or now intellectual disability a decade ago are now, get, now given a diagnosis of both intellectual disability and autism or just autism alone. This Nature article suggests, in its, groupings, uh, suggests its groupings would leave 46% of the increase in autism as unexplained. In my opinion, the environment will most certainly have a role in this unexplained category. When scientists think about environment, they tend to think of the word environment as having a capital E, which I equate to involving environmental pollutants and toxins, or the word environment may actually begin with a small e, which could equate to social behavioral changes, including all the already mentioned uh, issues of spatial clustering, parental age, awareness, and diagnostic accretion, plus other explanations. Other contributing small e environmental influences could be societal changes arising due to differences in the workplace introduced by the information age, new anthropological factors, uh, may also have a play with respect to how mates find each other, what we call assortative mating, or even what forces are shaping the brains and therefore human evolution. Returning back to the capital E form of environment, the challenge has always been, as I alluded to earlier, that it's very, very, very complex. In fact, so complex, it's probably impossible to, to tackle in a non-hypothesis-directed manner. However, there is much evidence in the field that new genes and the animal models and cell models that I talked about um, can now provide bona fide targets for systematic testing of potential environmental toxins for their effects in autism. So I will just summarize my talk on this last slide by borrowing from some of the themes presented earlier. The clinical trailblazers like, um, like Professor Kanner and Asperger and Wing and Rudder and others, uh, some in this audience, have developed a concept of the triad of behavioral symptoms, namely impairments in the reciprocal social interaction, verbal and nonverbal communication, and preference for repetitive stereotypical interests and in behaviors to help us define what we now call autism spectrum disorder. This behavioral classification will always be the mainstay of autism diagnosis. The past decade or so, however, has brought tremendous advances in first studies of genetics of autism, and second, understanding the role of the brain in autism. Specific, specific genes, such as the ones that I have uh, discussed, have now been identified, and it is now known that the protein products that they encode are involved in the development and maintenance of neuronal synapses in some cases. When there's a disturbance in the balance of these proteins at the synapse, sometimes too much, sometimes too little, the brain cells work differently, which can lead to autism. Importantly, I think going forward to attempt to fully understand the enigma we call autism, we need to consider a new triad, a new paradigm that encompasses the three core concepts shown in the modified Venn diagram on this slide. The three core concepts include the clinical understanding in blue, the genomic understanding in red, and understanding of the brain in green. 
As is often the case when studying such complex systems in science, I believe the next round of breakthroughs will come by studying the medical and scientific data sets operating at and being derived from the interface of these different systems. Ultimately, with this knowledge, we will understand the individual in a more complete way, and this will drive forward new breakthroughs, offering hope for better treatment options in individuals with, and families with autism. <clears throat> Last, it is important to re-emphasize that every complex biological system is really a sensor of its environments. Studying the environmental influences on the individual at each stage of life may not only provide explanations for the unexplained causes of autism, but also provide a different path forward in prevention and treatment. This last image <clears throat> shown at the center of the graph is of course uh, Tom Thompson's famous painting called The West Wind. Here a solitary pine tree stands, reminiscent of the neurons in autism. Perhaps this tree has a sparser branching network compared to other trees. This may be due to the nature of the genetics of the individual tree or because it stands away from the protective forest weathering the rather harsh Canadian climate like it is today. As we attempt to continue to decipher the complexities of autism, we will need to study the trees in exquisite de detail, but also the forest surrounding them. Thank you for your attention. So, Steve, thank you very, very much. I think you get a sense of what we were saying and that we were actually at the verge of understanding and moving things along, and yet there's still tremendous complexity that exists. Uh, and we're going to pursue some of this a little bit further with our panel discussion. I'm going to introduce our other two panelists, and then I'm going to ask each of them to come up and... Uh, give us, uh, say something for about a few minutes, five minutes, and then we're going to have a general uh, question that I'm going to uh, uh, introduce. We will not have an open audience uh, question and answer, but we will have time <coughs> later on to ask them at the coffee uh, and cookies, I think we're going to have after. So, so if we don't have cookies, I'm going to be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> 